All right, here we go. We're live. Uh, hey, EDU 300, this is Billy, and we are here tonight with Becca, Caitlin, Abby, and we just had Laura with us, but she just um, disappeared, and hopefully she'll make it back. And we have our guest with us tonight, Jonathan Werner from Cape Elizabeth Schools. We're here to talk CMR and TPAC with Jonathan, and we want to thank you for joining us, Jonathan. My pleasure. All right, it's your show, brother. Go for it. All right, so um, let me give you a little bit of an introduction so you know why I know what I know. Um, <clears throat> I was an English teacher in Gorham. Well, I was an English teacher in Pennsylvania. Then I had the extraordinary misfortune to go to law school. I was a lawyer for a little while. I was miserable. I went back to teaching. I taught in Gorham from 2005 to 2012. And then I became the tech integrator for Cape Elizabeth High School. And after that, um, they, the middle of that year, the librarian announced her retirement, and she said, you should apply for this job. And I said, me? I'm not a librarian. Um, and she said, you can get certified. Here's what you do. Here's where you go to graduate school. And you'd be great for this job because libraries and technology are going like this. And um, we want to see how that happens. OK, about the same time, I get on Twitter. And um, I start to realize that there's a whole network out there of teacher librarians like me who are really incredible um, advocates for libraries in the 21st century. So several of them pull me into the ISTE Librarians Network. Um, and I am now the president-elect of the ISTE Librarians Network, which means pretty much nothing except that I get to run their playground at ISTE in Colorado. And then I get to um, kind of govern the body for the next year and, and run their professional development and whatever else. And then I hand my heavy crown over in San Antonio in 2017. So what's my job? My job as a library and instructional technology specialist. Oh, by the way, I got hired. Turned out. Um, so I'm a library instructional technology specialist, better known as a LITS. Um, we enjoy going to $3 Dewey's for the LITS, Schlitz, Blitz. <laughs> so cheesy. Um, and um, I work half time in the middle school and half time in the high school. Um, there's a full-time librarian, Amanda Kazaka, at the middle school, and a full-time librarian at the high school, Carolyn Young. Um, the three of us have this sort of task of a multiple front war on um, library and information technology plus regular technology integration. And on any given day, we are co-teaching a class. We are with um, teachers doing professional development. Um, with Tom Charles Trey, who is the tech integrator for Pond Cove, which is our elementary school, we run cross-district programs. That, that would be the excitement of my children doing something. Sorry. Hey, bring it out there. Um, <laughs> the goal of our job is sort of three-part. One is the library skills and information literacy and research. One is professional development for our, our um, staff. And the third is uh, technology integration on two fronts, both with our staff and with our students. So I spend a huge amount of time not actually saying the words TPAC and SAMR, but living TPAC and SAMR. And I have tattoos, but I can't show them to you because that would be awkward um, <laughs> all about those two tasks. Um, so what do you need to know? I'm going to do this, this thing called screen share. So in a moment here, you're going to see what's on my screen. Um, and to do that, for just a minute, it's going to do something wacky, which is there. So Abby and Caitlin, while he's pulling that up, like if you were to hover over to the left, you'll see some tools, and the second one down, the green one, is screen share. Okay. All right. Right so, now, do you see three circles? We yes. see them. Cool. All right. Yes. So um, we're going to start with TPAC, because I think this one is really great. Now. All right. That's fine. Um, in Nicholas practice. When you hear the classical guitar in the background, that's just my theme song. Um, OK, so this diagram, I think, is a phenomenal description of how these overlap. So the P in TPAC is pedagogy. The C is content knowledge. That The pink one is usually labeled content knowledge. And then the green one is technology. So my experience in Cape Elizabeth and in many other um, high-performing schools by all the traditional metrics is that the pedagogy circle and the content circle are really strong. That means we have good teachers who know how to teach, and they know their stuff. 
And those two areas, if you look at the purple box, it says masterful 20th century classroom with strong content and good application of learning theory. Many, 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 many schools in Maine, especially here in Cumberland County, would describe themselves in that way. They have great teachers who know their stuff, and um, they are really powerful um, educators in any context, and they would have been the top of their game up until we introduced pretty significant technology, say around 2000, into classrooms. Here's the sticky right here. The green circle is 21st century technology, and um, I don't know whether you guys have seen this, but there's a really cool video. Maybe someone can link it in there, um, or I can do it afterwards. Um, it's called Above and Beyond, and it was created by the Partnership for 21st Century Learning, and it is this really remarkable, simple, four-minute video in which two neighbors are given a kit to make an airplane. And they are um, working collaboratively across a fence. And the boy says, I can't do this. It's way too um, complicated, and I have to follow the instructions. And so he opens up the instructions, and he gets really, really bogged down in the details. And the girl says, this is ridiculous. Why would I do that when I have the opportunity to be creative? And so she reaches across the fence and is like, hey, bud, let's do this together. And spoiler alert. They collaborate and they win the, um, it's to build like a boxcar derby, whatever, soapbox derby car, and they win the race that's set up for these cars by building an airplane. And P21 is part of what advocating for the four skills that are happening there. Um, the first one is collaboration, working together. The second is creativity, trying to figure out how we can work not within the bounds that we're given, but within um, the limits of our own, only within the limits of our own imagination to solve problems. The third is critical thinking, coming up with ways to analyze problems and solve them using our best problem-solving skill set. And then finally, communication. So collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creativity, that's what um, P21 advocates. They're called the four C's. And 21st century technology is intended to enable those four C's. So we'll talk in a minute about SAMR and how that works into this. But for the moment, I have a ton of experience in the 21st century technology that I'm trying to shove that green circle in my district closer and closer so there's more and more overlap with pedagogy and content. In the ideal world, that white box that's in the upper right-hand corner, you would have classrooms that demonstrate masterful 21st century classrooms focused on essential learnings, applying good learning theory supported by technology. Notice there that the technology is not freestanding. And I think the word that we use in the Kip Elizabeth Library and Learning Commons, which is my home base, um, is that we say we want our curriculum and our building not to have tech destinations, but to be tech infused. And the technology and the technology skills are never the goal, or they're very rarely the goal. Instead, making the learning happen with that technology is our prime objective. So Amanda, Carolyn, and I really focus on that white box. How can we make it possible for these great teachers to utilize our tools so that not only do they have great pedagogy and content knowledge, but they also have the 21st century technology that allows them to rethink their teaching and learning. And that's what we'll talk about in SAMR in just a second. But um, permitting them to end up with the kind of ideal classroom where they would have the capacity to lim limitlessly teach um, their students with no walls in their classroom, with no sensibility that resources are not available to them. And in my context, that has meant um, in the last 10 or 15 years, librarians used to search for needles in the haystack, and now we have to hold back the flood tide and teach kids, how do I analyze all this stuff that's out there? Um, if you ever look at the example we often give is martinlutherking.org, does anyone out there know who owns martinlutherking.org? That's right, Bobby. It's the Klan. The Ku Klux Klan owns martinlutherking.org, and it is a front for their crazy, racist, nightmare website. But a kid who wants to Google it is like, oh, good, martinlutherking.org, sweet. Oh, oh my goodness, I just learned something really not nice about the Jews and about the Negroes, and it goes on and on. You're like, holy moly, how do I teach this kid? that they need to think critically, actually critical thinking, about their information. 
So from our point of view, technology is really intended not to be an end in and of itself, but something that enables us to provide the four C's to our students and to provide the tools to our teachers so they can provide the four C's to our students. How much is that happening in this state? Given that we've had the MLTI initiative for well nigh more than a decade, not enough. Um, and I feel like a tremendous amount of job security because there isn't in any huge way meaningful TPAC going on. There is still some fantastic um, pedagogy and content knowledge in many, many schools. But my sort of directive to push the technology towards it, even in Cape Elizabeth, we haven't made a lot of progress. And I would urge you to think about two things. One, any district you want to work in, what is their burning platform? What is it that is demanding um, attention in that district? And in my district, where the scores are great and the college admissions are through the roof, I have a really hard time saying to people, you aren't doing the job that you need to do without these tools. You're already um, doing exactly what our metrics, college admissions and test scores, say you need to do. So they're like, hey, bud, go flat kite. You don't need to change my practice unless they come to me. So I often say, I have no stick and only as sexy a carrot as I can create. Like, hey, guys, come see my technology. It's so pretty. Um, but they don't end up necessarily having any reason to come see me because unless they invite me into their classroom, there's nothing in our district saying we have got to change things. Mm -hmm. So I would ask you as you look at districts, what, does, what is their mission? What are they trying to do? And then the second piece for me I would ask is how is technology viewed in the district? That is, is it seen as a current situation? Is it seen as a future objective? Is it on a trajectory towards growth? And really, you will look great during an interview saying to people, could you tell me a little bit about how technology is integrated in this district? And maybe give me a few specific examples of places where you feel like technology is being used really well. And, awesome segue, if it's being used only for substitution, run away! Because we've had substitution for 10 years, and no one has made any meaningful progress in those districts if there isn't something else pushing us. Can you tell I'm capable of talking without breathing because I'm from New York? So I'm going to pause there and take some questions, if there are any, and then I'll move on to Samer and explain the brilliant way in which those two things overlap. You guys have any questions? Abby, Caitlin, or, and Laura, if you have one, you could type it in the box. We could ask it for you. Nothing yet over here. Is it good? Yeah. All right, cool. I'm good. Cool. <laughs> I do want to say, Werner, I love that you mentioned MLK.org because I use that to teach evaluating sources when I was at Lewiston, that and The Onion, and you'd be really surprised with how many students Go for it. didn't critically think about the sources they were receiving. They're like, oh, it looks legit. So I just love that you brought that example. Um, if you guys looking, are looking for another fantastic one, Tree Octopus is hilarious. Um, just Google Tree Octopus, and the website is set up. It's so aesthetically pleasing, and we really need to save the endangered tree octopus of the Pacific Northwest, man. He is going out of style, and he's going to be killed if we're not careful. Wait a minute. There is no tree octopus, and they're citing their own website as their only source. Oh! Um, so that's another great example. And then... Um, I would also point out that one of the major contributors and anchors of The Onion, Warner, really hilarious guy who, not me, but a guy named Warner, who's pretty funny. Okay, any good. questions? Are we good? I'm going to screen share again, and this time we're going to look at the Samer coffee cups, which I love. Well, Jonathan, screen sharing, one of your resources you have in your module this um, this 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 week is some of these, actually this image here that I talked about the show, and I, I added like four or five of my favorites. Cool. Um, hold on a second, I have to, come on. I have to unscreen share for just a second because you need to know that every good library and structural technology specialist really come on, come on, has, but come here, don't be afraid, they're nice. <laughs> Is this? I know. Is this oh, a, oh. Who has runt in her litter, and everyone's like, "Oh, your puppy's so cute." I'm like, "I'm not gonna tell you she's actually five years old and behaves worse than any puppy you know." All right. So going back to school. 
Jonathan, not to cut you off, but it uh, looks like Angela joined us. I don't know if she's there, but welcome, Angela. Hey, how are you? Jonathan's about to start talk, talking Samar right now. Um, so this is um, a really kind of cool digest. There are a bunch of different ways that this is shown, but for me, this is the easiest one. And um, I think in a portfolio you were presenting to a district, if you said, you know, I want to think about the ways in which all of these levels are valuable additions to um, a classroom, but I'm really, my goal is to modify and redefine my work, that would be a pretty powerful statement, and they would be hard-pressed to think of you as a typical teacher coming in who's like, yeah, I'm going to lecture, and I'm going to whatever, um, you know, give them tests. I want to think about, you say, how I can modify and redefine my teaching and learning and my students' experience using technology. So in this diagram, substitution is seen as a direct substitute. So this would be something like, I have created a PDF, I'm loading it onto their iPads, and I'm putting it in Google Drive, and I can read my PDF digitally without having to print it out. Super for the environment, maybe really valuable tool, and definitely better than printing it, but pretty much the exact same thing as if they had photocopied something and asked you to work on the worksheet. So that's the blue one on the left. Um, it is the cup of coffee. Then augmentation. You add something to the cup of coffee. TechX is a direct tool substituting for something else, but it has a functional improvement. So this might be something like Kahoot, where if you've seen that, it's an online quiz, and you might be able to give um, a quiz or even have a, com a contest in your classroom, but Kahoot as an app or as an online uh, to a website will give students the immediate feedback about the answers, and it turns them into a competition, and they see a leaderboard. And if you have ever tried this in the middle school class, it is hilarious. You could be talking about, like, different types, types of mucus, and they are jumping out of their seats to get the mucus type on that board. Um, and the cha-ching feeling they have, that they're like, sweet, I knew which mucus it was, um, is pretty awesome. Yeah, not to cut you off, Jonathan, but uh, for our students, that those types of apps will be the focus of the next module where we'll work with different types of apps like Kahoot and Pear Deck. So that's coming. So keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah. And they are great augmentation and even sometimes modification tools. But you want to think about them as offering primarily um, an enhancement of what you would otherwise be doing um, uh, with pen, paper, and um, what we refer to in my school sometimes as the tablets, which we actually are referring to the iPads, but many people would argue that we could equally do well with a stone tablet and some kind of like piercing device to write on it because that's how they're used in so many of our classrooms. Um, so that's number one and two. In a second, we're going to look at this thing called the SAMR swimming pool, which will define this better. But there is a clear demarcation, a, a very heavy line between augmentation and modification. So S and A are kind of together, and then modification and redefinition are the other two, and they're kind of on the other side of the 50-yard line. So modification is tech allowing for significant task redesign. So now we've added some sugar, it's a macchiato action, and modification means, in this case, that the task is not simply um, made better by technology, but the task is made different. So I might give you the example of... Um, students who uh, attended an author talk that we had in the library a few uh, months ago. And in advance, they had read the book by the author. And then um, the author Skyped in or whatever, Google hung out with, in with them. They got to answer questions um, or ask questions, and he answered them. Then they went away for a week. They read another piece they had did, done. They did some writing. He provided digital feedback about their creative writing. And then they came back together and talked in the second session about their writing instead of his writing. Modification in that instance, and he was in, I think, somewhere in the south. So it is not something that would have been able to be possible, but the tech also not only allowed him to Skype in, which is probably just an augmentation, right, where he's effectively on a video phone call, and he could have walked into the room if he was available. Many authors, by the way, will do these for free because they don't have any cost, and you can get a pretty major author into your classroom or into your school library. Um, with a Google Hangout, oftentimes they limit them to 15 minutes, but 15 minutes with someone like pretty significant to those kids can be remarkable. So in this instance, the technology allowed for them to have direct feedback from the author, to work through drafts and iterations of their writing with the author. Their teacher was collaborating with them too. 
And then they had these two rounds of conversations, one focused on his work and one on theirs. And that, he never could have given them that kind of feedback real time, right? In an hour of his time, never would have been possible. But in that hour, they could be really productive and he could pull out the threads, which obviously was amazing to be willing to do this, but he could pull out the threads that were common between them and teach sort of a master class mini lesson around what was most beneficial to all of them. So that's just an example. Modification can happen a lot of ways, but that one was pretty powerful to me. And then redefinition is where the technology allows for something completely different to take place. And in this case, I would give you, and I'll kind of defer this conversation for you guys until you cover it more fully, but something called app smashing. Have you guys talked about that at all yet? Not yet. Okay. So, we have, we're going to cover that during digital storytelling module. Okay. So digital storytelling is a great example of this. So you take photographs with your, in my case, we're an iPad one-to-one -one district, so every kid 5 through 12 has their own iPad. They are, oh, I'll give you actually a specific example that we just had. Um, one of our teachers in seventh grade is doing a science project affiliated with that um, program that looks for invasive species um, through the main POSO blah, blah, blah. Um, and they end up with photographs on their iPad of the invasive species that they've located. They do the research on the iPad, but then they create interactive projects that teach the viewers about their invasive species and how it how it happens and sort of what the issues are that are, arise as a result of that invasive species. Um, by creating a real audience for those people, um, for those students with the real world, not only they're contributing science, uh, scientific data to a larger study, something that would never have been possible before, they're creating websites and blogs and interactive, um, in this case they do iBooks, that have a real audience. Scientists are reviewing their work and giving them feedback. The creation of those books, the only way we could have done it in the past would have been like cut and paste paper, you know, or do the same thing in like a Google Doc. But these are live linked. When you tap on the kids' photos, um, you'll go to a video that the kid took down at the ocean and they're like, oh, here's this invasive species. Here's what happens. Let me show you what's going on. They can do 360s. Like if you tap here, you can spin around where I was standing and see this environment. So I think that would be a great example. And this final project is now being presented to parents at parent conferences in two weeks. And those parents are getting the sense not only does the kid have a really deep understanding, they worked really hard for the presentation because they knew it was going to have a live audience. The kid has a mastery of the technology skills, often far outshining mine. Um, the other day this kid was like, Mr. Warner, you're totally wrong about that. Do this. And I will say, as a teacher, being willing to accept that and being like, absolutely, thank you so much. Maybe you didn't have to be so rude, Sammy, but anyway. Um, being willing to teach um, in such a way that your kids know they can offer you feedback and correct you is really powerful. And in our um, library and learning commons, I'm not ever grading them. So it's great for me because I can be like, bring it on. Teach me anything you want. And I can maybe show them steps one and two, and they come back with step nine later on. And like, oh, did you know this app does this, and you can add this, and you can put a music track in from this place, and there's free sound from this. So I think those have become, those iBooks have become this pretty powerful example of how without the technology, you simply couldn't do the project. So if you're looking at redefinition, if you take the technology away, the project or the work or the classroom is no longer possible. That's kind of the the sum or, or what you have to have. Um, if you have a, a project that is defined by its own redefinition, then the technology going away means that the project couldn't exist. Jonathan, we got a good good opportunity to cut you off for a second. We got a couple of questions slash comments running through. Becca, do you want to ask Laura's question for? Right. So Jonathan, you probably see in the chat, Laura asked, and I think you'd be really great at fielding this one in more detail, uh, Laura asked, what if you have a lot of lesson plans that only make it to Sam? Is that still pretty good, or do all teachers strive only to get to that R level? It seems like only yesterday we were excited to get to S. Awesome. Great question. Yes. So let me screen share again, because that is answered directly by the next image, which is Sam's swimming pool. I was um, going to say, is it the swimming pool? Yeah, it is. So I'm going to go back over here. You guys have a link to this in your doc if you want, but this is what it looks like. Um, so this guy named Don Orth, no, I lied. That's the wrong person. This guy named Carl Hooker, um, who is out of Texas, and he works with my friends at EdTech Teacher, who are the bomb. They're so amazing, down in Boston. Um, Carl said, here is what you want to think about. And Laura, your question is great, which is, do I always have to have redefinition, have great 
um, and let's go back to TPAC, to have great technology integration with my pedagogy and content knowledge, do I have to always reach definition? Absolutely not. Carl would say, and his article is also linked in your outline there, that if you are substituting some of the time, you are already miles ahead of other people, and your kids are going to get a lot out of many, many substitutions. If you can augment, if you notice in this diagram, there was, I said there was like a hard and fast line between SA and MR. He calls those two enhancement. Substitution and augmentation are ways in which te technology enhances the teaching and learning. If you are enhancing two, three times a week with your classrooms and your lessons, I think you are worlds ahead of many, many teachers who are terrified of the technology and either say, you can't use it in my classroom, or who find that if kids are using it, they're misusing it. So if you can get them actively, meaningfully substituting and augmenting, you are enhancing their learning incredibly. And even if you only reach that barrier, what is that thing called, the floats that define the shallow end, you're doing a lot. And I like that um, Carl doesn't put it right at the edge of the shallow end, but halfway down the hill, to say you're making some decent progress towards transformation, even if you're only doing substitution, substitution and augmentation. Transformative, he says, are the places where you reach modification and redefinition. And I will say, if you're modifying your teaching and learning, boom, you are doing way more than I would say the majority of teachers I talk to in any given week. And I mean not just in Cape Elizabeth, but across the state when I'm presenting, in New England when I'm presenting, and through the many, many people I've had the opportunity to meet it through ISTE. Um, it is clear to me that we are, in many ways, still a 19th century teaching and learning model in the United States, and there are very few states with the kind of technology integration at the level and the, the depth that we have in Maine, and yet even here, the majority of places that I've experienced or I've interacted with are only substituting um, if they're using the technology that's available to them at all. So that to me is a really, that's like my personal mission, that if you say to me technology is not being used, I'm going to say we are not teaching our kids how they need to be thinking in the 21st century. But I want to say what I said at the beginning again. The fact that there is technology involved in no way makes the teaching better. And in many cases, I will argue that technology can make teaching worse because it makes teachers lazy. And it gets them to think that the technology is replacing their good pedagogy. And if that's happening, close the laptop, flip the iPad over, and start from scratch with the substantive, meaningful pedagogy and the methodology that then the technology um, makes more uh, engaging or more richer, whatever, however it's changing it, it's adding another layer on top of the great teaching model. Um, I'll say also that I love about Carl's model that um, you can go in and out of this pool as many times as you want. So I always think of it as like substitute and out, augment and out, modify and out, redefine, woo, hey, wait, I'm drowning, get out again. And that to me is a really great um, reminder that we never need to be doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. Triple negative. We do not need to be doing this all the time to be great teachers. And I will say too that inspired by my man Tom Charles Trey, who I mentioned earlier, who is the um, technology integrator at our uh, elementary school, he said, you know, we can do coding exercises. We did this hour of code event called um, the Coder Express. We can do coding exercises that are completely analog. And we found this one where um, students taught their parents, um, it was a family night, students taught their parents how to stack cups. But, and that sounds like, oh, great, stacking cups. But the teachers, sorry, the students had to, without using any indication, only words, tell their parents how to make a design that was in front of the student but that the parent couldn't see. So the kid is looking at a diagram. And they can't use their hands. They can't do anything except talk. And they want their parents to build what they're describing. That's coding. They're trying to code their parents to make the parents understand the specificity necessary and the kid understand how easy it is to slip up. Um, if you want to Google this one, MIT has a hilarious one for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And the kids or the students write instructions. And then teachers follow them. And the kids watch. And they're like, spread the peanut butter on the bread, and the teachers will spread it on the edge. Or they will cover the bread in like a really thick layer of peanut butter. Or um, they'll say put it on the bread, and they haven't told them to open the bag yet. 
so the teachers are spreading peanut butter on the bag um, without having opened it. So there are ways in which you can get messages across that are even directly about technology that have no technology in them. So SAMR isn't even on the table. You're not substituting, much less redefining, and yet you're teaching them critical thinking skills and you're teaching them problem solving. Um, if you've seen Carol Dweck's work, she talks about a growth mindset. More than anything else, Amanda, Carolyn, and I feel like we are not teaching technology. We're not even teaching content. We are teaching kids, because we don't have content-based classes, we're teaching them growth mindset. How do I um, encounter a problem and change my approach to it so that I don't feel defeated by it, or I don't feel like, hey, who can do this for me? Instead, I think creatively about how to solve those problems. And by far, the most engaging experiences I have as a teacher now come out of moments when I feel like kids are, um, whether it's with or without technology, are demonstrating a growth mindset and demonstrating the ability to really um, be creative, think critically, um, use their, their um, uh, little communication skills, and then collaborate with one another to develop something that looks much better than the product would have looked either without technology or if they were working on their own. So, what other questions? I want to show you one other thing before I shut my face. But any other questions about the SAMR piece that we talked about? Angela, did you have a question or comment earlier? Do you want to share? Or are you are you cool? Yes, but I don't. On oh, okay. You're good. Yeah, I think we can hear you right now. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. No, no. We can hear you. <laughs> I just want to know how we can use this, like in math classes. Everything I'm researching and seeing really seems to work well with like history and literary type subjects, but like algebra, it seems to be a little more difficult. Cool. All right. So I'm going to um, defer because Carolyn in my building handles the uh, science and math much more than I do um, because it's a better skill set for her and I am lame in that area. <laughs> like science after junior year of high school and haven't thought about it. So my kids came home and asked me science questions that I cannot answer. I hate uh, math is good. Um, I will say that this is where, in whenever I get a question like this, I will turn to Twitter, and I will search. Um, so your term there was algebra. Actually, you know what? I'll screen share so you can see the magic happening live. And, um, and while, while he's screen sharing, I just popped in a couple of my favorite follows. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, check those guys out. It's Kyle, Kyle Pierce and John Orr, who are incredible uh, math teachers who do quite a bit of blogging and share, share their classroom uh, quite frequently. So definitely follow those two guys, and I'd be happy to connect you with them as well. Awesome. Yeah, and I shared my friend, and I'll share the link to my friend Jennifer Michaela. She teaches math at Greeley. She's taught everything from remedial algebra 1 to AP stats, and she does amazing work with both um, interactive notebooks, which the word interactive could be a little misleading because it's interactive on paper, and mm -hmm. technology. And she's an active blogger and a member of the Math Teachers of the Blogosphere. Am I right with that one, guys? <laughs> um, Sounds about right. <laughs> a thriving PLN for blogging math teachers, so I'll add links to that. Because oh, I know that's awesome. a valuable resource for her. Yeah. Maybe we can connect her uh, with Jennifer for a classroom visit or a Google Hangout or something um, of that sort. Yeah. Does that sound good, Angela? That sounds awesome. Okay. Great. All right. Werner, All right. go for it. Back to you, sir. So I'd like to point out that I typed in algebra. So I'm just going to fix that first. Algebra. There we go. But this is the top tweet about algebra. I'm probably not going to look at Slate for my guidance. So instead, I follow 200 people that I have chosen as my really um, highly curated group of experts. And if you want to look at who they are at any point, and this is the case for anyone, you can always go to the person's profile. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, click on the individual you want. Hey, nice image right there. Oh, that looks cool. Okay. So yeah. click on the person you want. And then under their name, you'll see doo -doo 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 -doo, um, that there's followers. So I have 2938 people looking at me, but I follow 200. 
And you can look at anyone's follows. So if you find um, Jennifer's Twitter account, look at who she follows, and it's like the best pyramid scheme ever because you start out with one, and you immediately have all the resources that she's using. And for that same reason, you'll find, find the same way, you'll find their incredibly powerful hashtags to find. And the one I'll show you in just a second is Math Chat, which is a really great one. But going back to the algebra search for a second, once you have found the people you want to follow, um, algebra, this is what I got to write. <laughs> Slate is still our top choice. Um, you'll notice that the default now in Twitter has been for a while now is top. That is not um, what I want to search. I want to search live, which means the most recent ones not dependent on their popularity. So Soledad here is the one who 34 seconds ago in the entire world of Twitter, Twitter was the last one to use the word algebra. Then I'm going to add more options, and I'm only going to look at the people I follow. So now you're looking at my people, my peeps, my tweeps, they're called, which is so nerdy, but whatever. My tweeps talking about algebra. So here's Tony. Keep going down. MindShift is an incredible resource. Jen Carey's amazing. Rafranz Davis kind of redefining for me, um, thinking about how technology gets integrated into classrooms. And like me, not necessarily hugely familiar with math and science but does an amazing job curating those resources. And then this is the person I was looking for, Lisa. She is a tech director, and I think she even actually now has a higher level administrative position at a small school outside of Boston. And she's just amazing in terms of math and science, um, but especially math resources. So now I notice, oh, she's using deeper learning. I might want to check that out. This is independent school education chat. And then um, you can search the two terms together. So you could be like, oh, look, I'm going to use both algebra and ISCD. It's going to default back to top over here, and you need to then go back to live. And now you're going to find every tweet that's out there using those two terms together. So that I do not Google anything having to do with technology integration, best practices, pedagogy, school, um, pretty much anything from work to my, related to my professional life. Unless I'm assisting a kid with how to do advanced Google searches, I am never looking on Google for resources. I'm looking on Twitter. So I will finish that little harangue by saying, let's look at math chat for a second. And um, in general, chats take place in two ways. One is they are in a certain time on a certain day. So at chat main, E-D-C-H-A-T-M-E, takes place on Mondays at 8.30. My chat, or the one I co-organize, is called 121 Tech Chat. It's hashtag the number one, T-O, number one, T-E-C-H, T-H-A-T. Sorry, I couldn't remember where I was in the word. Um, 121 Tech Chat meets Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. There's another kind that roll, and so people will just use that hashtag to continue long-term conversations. So Brian is an amazing resource for math. I'm a great person to follow. In this instance, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look at math chat. I'm going to do the people I follow and discover that besides Brian, here's Alice, MindShift, Scott McLeod. So you can end up with lists of people that are really the ones you want to know, learn from about the various topics. And for me, the best way to do that, I'm uh, Twitter lets you curate lists or create lists, not just the people you follow, but you can take each individual and, is it here? Yeah, you can add them to a list um, here, and it will ask you, do you want to create a list for this person, or here are some ones that I have going already. You can add them to that, and then you have created basically a dictionary for yourself or an index or encyclopedia of the best practice individuals whom you can then look to for more information. So that is a really long way of saying, like a librarian, I have no idea how to answer your question, but I know where to find it. So that's, that's, that's exactly what we want to do. We, I mean, we can show you a resource, or we can show you how we get our resources, which is right. the PLN is that glue that kind of holds us all together, and, and Twitter Twitter works for us. Uh, yeah. We do have, hey, we have a clarified question here. We're actually uh, trying to dive deeper into this. Laura wants to know, 
Is there a way to search for the info that Angela is looking for on Twitter in the same way as Google, like using two terms, algebra and SAMR, together? So yes, but you don't use those things that are um, between them are called Boolean um, search terms. So like AND, OR, you don't use those. The simplicity of the Twitter search is um, assuming that it's just looking for frequency because there are 140 characters, it would actually be looking for the word and. So all you do is put both terms in. You cannot do an or. You would have to do one search and then the other search. And you cannot do a not. So you, know, you can use a percentage sign in Google to mean not, but um, you can't do anything like that in Twitter. So yes, you can to an extent, but it is basically um, an and search all the time. I will say if people are not doing it this way, um, I will give you my little spiel that I give my middle school students. Boys and girls, what is the primary purpose of Google? Becca. Um, to find things? You know, it's funny you should say that, but as I tell my seventh graders, wrong! That is not the purpose of Google. Billy, what's the purpose of Google? Oh, to grow your brain and figure things out. Dude, like my You're seventh You're trying so hard. You have fallen deep into the well. The purpose of Google, boys and girls, is to sell you something. How do I know? Because I'm going to Google banana, and am I going to get a banana? Yes, but the first result is going to be Banana Republic. Never make that mistake again. I forgive you this time. If you go back to Google, and you Google advanced search, this is the easiest way to get there. You're looking for this URL, which used to be available on the main screen, but it isn't anymore. You tap Google and search, and this is the only place you should conduct any meaningful non-commercial research using Google. Thou shalt not ever again make the mistake of saying in response to what is Google's main purpose to search things. It is intended to sell you things. Otherwise, we would not have Google's billionaire corporation. Ergo, Never again will you use anything but advanced search. Today's lecture on information literacy is now concluded. OK. Any other questions before I do my last two things? How are we feeling out there, guys? You all set? <laughs> Give a thumbs up if you're all set. If you got a question, feel free. We're good? To and I have mm -hmm. to say, Warner, without even knowing it, you're doing a really good reinforcement of our last module. So this is content transfer continuity. Um, for our PLN project because we're really trying to emphasize the value of Twitter both for networking and for finding resources. So thank you for doing that without any prompting. Oh, my pleasure. Actually, um, it's a secret plan. I, I've attended all your... No, never mind. Um, I'm glad that I'm doing it. Remind me at the very end to show you one more slide. I have to switch out of um, my, my browser. But I want to show you something that I reinforces that so much so that I have been nearly thrown under a literal bus for the argument that I make. But I'll leave you that quick prepare for one moment. So this is um, Kyle Dweck's growth mindset diagram. Um, he basically says the fixed mindset is very 19th century. It leads to a desire to... Can you see my arrow? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this leads to a desire to look smart and therefore a tendency to avoid challenges, give up easily, see effort as fruitless or worse, ignore useful negative feedback, and feel threatened by the success of others. Oh, that's like half the teachers I had in high school, and unfortunately, way too many who remain in schools today. Fixed mindset, if you notice here, remains a very skinny line, avoiding conflict, and eventually resulting in a plateau early and achieving less than their full, full potential, resulting in a deterministic view of the world versus Dweck's growth mindset, Intelligence can be developed over time. It is not static. This leads to the desire to learn. And look how this line, literally, I love this image, embraces each of these things. And as it embraces, it grows. They persist. They see effort as a way to get to mastery. They learn from criticism and they welcome it. And then they find, as I said, as a teacher, I ask my students, what am I doing wrong? Tell me so I can improve. And then find the lessons and the inspirations from their successes to grow and here, almost like the happy ending we all hope for, as a result, they reach ever higher levels of achievement, 
all this giving them a greater sense of free will. Sounds a lot like the Partnership for 21st Century Education's four C's. Don't memorize, don't digest. The minute you teach them facts and not how to find them, you are teaching them wrong information because we know the world is changing way too fast for us to rely on today's information. They need to know, I don't know, something like how to do a Google Advanced Search so that they can come up with something more current but also more applicable to their specific situation. Okay, I leave you with this amazing overlap from Kathy Schrock of Bloom's Taxonomy and SAML. And she says, as you move from substitution towards redefinition, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Kathy, you go for, Kathy's page is in your resources this week, too, guys. Sorry, Jonathan. No, no, go for it. Um, you start with remembering, right? And this is not Bloom's taxonomy like you need. Um, it, it's not just the sensibility of, like, um, what you require from the world, but the learning taxon taxonomy. So um, you start off with, it's a little hard to read, remembering there on the bottom. You move up towards understanding, read, then applying, analyzing, evaluating, finally creating. If your students are not creating in your classroom, whether it's in a makerspace, it, whatever it is, if they are digesting, if they are remembering, and maybe even as basic as understanding, they cannot be moving educationally much beyond augmentation because to modify, they need to be able to apply. So this to me is sort of a great weaving back and forth between the, t the pedagogical on the left-hand side, like how we teach it, and the technological on the right-hand side, what tools we use to teach it. And if you show this one during an interview, they're going to be like, wow, this person is really smart because they realize that great teaching is a partner with great use, meaningful use of technology, and I can see how they really want to move I'm going back to the question earlier, do you have to be creating in every lesson? No, you shouldn't be. But you should probably be applying, analyzing, and or evaluating in every lesson so that the teaching has that kind of di dynamism, is that the right word? It's dynamic enough to respond to the ever-changing world in which those kids are learning. So I think from my point of view as a librarian, a teacher librarian, I'm saying to my kids, are using the technology, and to my teachers, are using the technology to apply, analyze, and evaluate, and in the best situations, also create? If so, keep using it. If not, put it down. Let's go back to square one and figure out. I, I will literally say, screens down, or put your technology away. We need to back up several steps and figure out where we went wrong, that all you're doing is trying to um, remember and understand. Those are great first steps, but if that's all you've been using the technology for, then we're missing something. So I'm going to go you know, for one second and show you the long promised statement of um, how I nearly got, I got yelled at, I'll say, for saying what I'm about to say, which is apparently I don't remember how to use Keynote. Um, OK, so um, we're going to open up. Sorry, I should have opened this before we started talking. Um, well, well, John, while Jonathan's opening this up, just just a couple comments. Um, yeah. I, I feel like this this would I, I put myself back in your shoes when I was um, when I was in ETEP, and I know Becky, you might be able to resonate with this. In a lot of this language and these approaches and these models can be maybe overwhelming to completely understand it at first. <laughs> just have that mindset that in time, as you're around the education field and you gain more experience, you, there'll come a time when you'll start to feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, and just know even Becca, Jonathan, myself, we're always evolving, we're always changing, we're always trying to develop our understanding of all these models as well. So it's tough for even experienced teacher to wrap their brain around this completely. Am I saying this the right way, Becca? No, absolutely. I'm listening to Jonathan and thinking about my own practice and, you know, how often I hit that creating level, and I'll be honest. It's not as frequently as I would like, but the nope. idea is to keep trying, tr keep thinking of ideas to get there. And there are some variables that are not completely outside of our control. But, you know, in the past I've been limited by, you know, what I actually have the authority to do. So I don't think that, you know, if you don't have the resources, if you need to go back and teach students digital citizenship or how to use the tech first in basics before going to the creation level, 
Like, that's okay. That's not on on you and your implementation if you're working towards a goal. Right. Um, I spend most of my time in the, the A&M, and, you know, I hit the redefinition when I'm really lucky. I'm, you know, I've only been teaching for five years now, and have only recently increased my capacity to use tech more creatively, so don't feel as though, you know, you need to hit that R every single time, because, you know, just trying, just being open to taking that risk with that growth mindset is a really huge step, like Jonathan said. Yeah. Jonathan, you got your slide, then we'll, we'll revisit that conversation a little more at the end. Uh, Jonathan, you, you ready for us? Yeah. Oh, there we can, go. You see, can you see the black, white, and red slide right now? Yep. So this is where I got roundly criticized. So um, a couple months ago now, I can't remember how long, um, I was invited to be one of the uh, keynotes at MassQ, which is like the actum of Massachusetts. And I thought, what is the matter with these people? What are you doing inviting me to do this? But it turned out what they wanted was a librarian talking about um, how this sort of growth mindset with your, your teaching and learning, not just with your kids, but with your um, teachers. So I did one session on 21st century library skills and whatever, but they asked me to focus my keynote piece on professional development models that rethink the process of how we offer PD. And um, you may have heard me say this before, but I call it sit, playing the sit and get dragon. So, so many people will suffer through these hideous PD sessions where they are lectured at about not lecturing. And I am on a warpath to get rid of lecture-based PD, which is why when I see you at EdCamp Maine, I'll be like, hey, hey, you are in the right place for PD. Um, but I have now made public my statement, and I will do again today, that if you are a district where PD is not encouraged and, and nurtured, uh, sorry, if PLCs, professional learning communities and PLNs, are not both encouraged and nurtured, nurtured as a required part of your professional development, you do not have effective professional development programming in your district. And I will say the million dollar question in your interview might be, how are PLCs and PLNs used as a part of the professional development in this district? And if they don't have a ready answer for you and some specific examples, again, run away. Because it means that they are, as a district, in a static mindset and they are not looking for ways they can grow. So what to me, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, John. Just, just one moment. Are you familiar with what a PLC is, guys? PLCs are professional learning communities, and uh, they can look a little different from district to district. To district. Uh, for example, my third grade PLC, we meet every Wednesday morning. We have an hour and 20-minute block that we meet, uh, and our, we have representatives not only from the third grade team, but we have special ed, we have response and intervention specialists, uh, we have an allied arts person, and my principal even sits in on my PLC. And PLCs are uh, aimed to really talk about kids. What does good pedagogy look, look, look like? Uh, what, what, what type of instructional experiences are we creating for our kids? And they're all about the kids. We're not sitting there to talk about our schedule. You know, we're going to meet at this time, or we're going to do this at this time. It's, okay, let's look at data. Let's look at performance of kids. And let's look at the type of experiences we're creating for them. So that, that's a PLC, if you're unfamiliar with that. And you'll find not all districts have PLCs, or they might have a different acronym for the same thing. Um, but they are different than your PLN, which is curated more by you for you. I know there are a lot of acronyms. <laughs> the, simple, the simplest explanation that was given to me I kind of love, a PLC, you share students. A PLN, you share interests. Nice. Yeah. That, was, that was sort of how it divided for me, and it makes a lot of sense. So I am in a ton of PLCs because of my job. I go from all different department meetings, all different grade level teams, because I share students with, with two schools worth of, um, you know, eight grades worth of classes. Um, my PLN, I have, as I said, intentionally limited to 200 because I can find it. I don't find that overwhelming, and I constantly modify who's in it because I want to make sure that they're the people that are the most useful for me. And I will say some people have circulated in and out again. Nothing against those people. And in fact, I keep some of them in lists that are not actually people I follow. But in terms of my PLN, those are the 200 people I trust. And it's the reason why I don't Google things. I um, search Twitter for anything I'm looking for. Can I ask right. one last question? Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. May I butt in for one minute? Of course. So that sort of speaks to the point we were talking about in our PLN module, our hangout with Matt Druitt Card, the idea that you don't need to feel pressure to follow back everyone who follows you, but be really, really discerning. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if I do this, if I play this slide, do you still see? Yeah. Are you seeing? You Looks see this perfect. slide? Looks great. Okay. So now let me show you what I do next. So in this same conversation, I say effective PD, right? Did you just see that change? Yes, sir. So I say very expressly with my my conversations, I could not do my job without my PLN and the talents they bring. I've said before, and I will say again, I would have left teaching if I had not found Twitter and my PLN, and I am dead serious about that. And it may be as simple as this example. Felix asked me um, to, he's a tech director down in Miami. He is hilarious. Um, asked me a question that I answered, and I turned around and I was like, hey, PLN, um, how do you guys scan QR codes? Because it's driving me bananas how much time it's taking. And he says, Enigma. It took him 17 seconds. I, literally, I checked later on. 17 seconds to answer that question. With it would have taken me days of research and trial and error. If there is a single thing that makes me more bananas about education, it is the hubris of people that think that they should reinvent the wheel. And for every time you teach this little play called Hamlet, you should start from scratch and not look at what other people are doing. Why in the name of bananas would I not ask my PLN for best practices before I brainstormed, or at least really early in the process, because <laughs> my thinking is going to be a hundred times more effective by trolling the room, right? Like asking people, what do you know about this? And in many cases has literally saved me days of doing this research or useless work that I don't really need to be doing. And for me, finding ways in which we can come up with norms for our professional development that come ar around this definition, that if you think about PD as being most effective when it is long-term, tool-based, collaborative, focused on the learning of all students, and linked to the curricula that teachers have to teach, that is district-based, PLC-related um, learning. Your district must provide you with that resource if you are going to continue to grow as a teacher. It has to be a part of the teaching and learning for your PLC. But to me, equally important is what I think of as like the band-aids, the ways in which at any given moment you have a problem that you need to solve or you need some ideas, you need creativity um, to address a problem. When that's the case, having in your back pocket your PLN and also having the capacity to turn to them for bigger issues when the PLC is not enough. That's how I have come to the realization that any great, P going back to what I said a minute ago, any really meaningful PD model in the district you're coming to work for has got to include both PLCs and PLNs, not one or the other, because you're going to need them for different things at different times. And without the twin, wonder twin powers of those two activated, you're going to end up with a big piece missing, and the only people that are going to suffer are your kids. And this question that I've become infamous for, when people ask, um, should we offer this PLC, uh, this professional development? And I say, how does it benefit students? And they say, well, we have to offer testing. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. How does it benefit students? We have to train people how to use, okay, but how does it benefit students? To the point that I, people want to deck me. If your PD is not normal, um, sorry, normative around its being student-centered, then there's something profoundly wrong. And I show this video frequently. Um, it came out of Chicago where this woman is lecturing to a room full of teachers, and this guy basically just turned on his iPhone and taped, uh, videoed 60 seconds of it, and you want to die in 60 seconds. And he goes on to say, this went on for 90 minutes over six sessions. Nothing to do with students. And that means zero to do with students. And you think, if your PLN and PLC are not your primary support, I love my conferences, I love my graduate classes, I mean, I even sometimes love my professors, but um, the, the situation on any day-to-day -day -day basis has got to allow you the opportunity. I mean, what I said to you about SAMR today, awesome, but the next time you're going to put it in place, you need someone to reinforce what I said, or you need to be able to go back to this document or this um, hangout 
you need to be able to turn to those resources if you're going to actually meaningfully apply it and, once again, change the experience of your students for the better. Well put. Yep. Thank you. That was exactly an hour, which, A, is literally six times what I promised, but second, um, very impressive for me to be able to keep it to an hour when I'm Mr. Bible Pan. Oh, no. I'm oh. impressed. Yeah. Um, you guys don't know, but Werner and I were joking about this a little bit the other day um, after a meeting. Billy and I have been working on sticking to our time constraints, and I honestly thought that this one, well, we don't, I just saw you pout. Um, no, me an hour like... is perfect, but we say we'll do 20 minutes and it'll be 45. So I'm actually impressed with both um, the timing, but also the depth. So it's a winner. Yeah. I agree. And my, my girlfriend will get off the chat and she'll show me how the room. She'll be like, what are you doing? Like, your students are probably bored. They're listening to you. Yeah, just you guys got to shorten it up. <laughs> so, so, so thank you, Jonathan. Like, like to echo what, um, what Becca said, I mean, you covered a lot of ground there and you did it in an hour. Let's fall, let's kind of finalize, wrap this up with maybe some Q and A. Is there any questions out there, you guys? Or no, kind of Abby's Q shrugging. A. Angela's feeling good. I'm good. Okay, just kind of get back to what we said earlier. Just know that it's it's a lot to soak in and give it time. You're getting a lot thrown at you, um, especially if this is all new to you and you're mostly very new or new to uh, the teaching profession. So just uh, have that idea, have that idea of the growth mindset. In there and um, things will come. And yeah, and we're, we were hoping that this um, hangout with Jonathan would help fuel more ideas for our discussion this week about SAMR, TPAC, how you know you can either think of ideas for your own classroom or a hypothetical classroom, and you know hopefully this will tie into that discussion or at least clarify some points so that you can proceed. And in terms of promotion, I have actually. Where is it? Oh, uh, Ed Camp Maine. <laughs> if you want to see a really rocking, um, teacher-driven PD and PLN in action, uh, this Saturday at Wayne Fleet School, eight o'clock, guys. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Camp Maine is underway. It's free. There's food. The three of us will be there. I think. Uh, yeah. Oh, Caitlin, Laura. Angela are in. Um, it's cool. a really valuable day to connect face-to-face -face with many of the teachers and educators that you've already connected with on Twitter. So I really encourage you guys to try to make it to Wayne Fleet this Saturday. Yeah, if you could make it, we'll, we'll definitely, let's, let's meet up for lunch. Maybe we can get a uh, ADU 300 uh, <laughs> lunch table together. Sounds good. Absolutely. Oh. All right, John. Uh, we're we're going to say 30. Oh, okay, cool. But you're welcome at 8. There's uh, great conversations to take place before, but the official gun goes off at 8.30. And there's plenty of coffee. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and yeah, for all of you guys for attending. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us, man. That was terrific. Dude, anytime. It was such a pleasure. I look forward to meeting you guys next year. Yeah, see you this weekend. All right.